Hola, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos, bienvenidas a Historias de Transformación, cambios que valen la pena conocer. En esta oportunidad nos acompaña otro invitado de lujo. Se trata de Michael Apple. Michael Apple es un académico eh, de la educación con una gran influencia y una gran trayectoria en las últimas décadas en todo el mundo. Sus textos se leen en la formación de profesores y de profesoras, en procesos relacionados con la pedagogía crítica y también en el desarrollo de de profesores y de profesoras. Además, su trabajo tiene una gran influencia en el ámbito sociológico, en las políticas eh, y en las visiones respecto de la sociedad. Así que estamos muy contentos de estar con Michael Lapin, que nos va a compartir su historia a continuación. This can be found in, that is, the stories come from you know, one of the newest books, the book that is I'm lead author on called The Struggle for Democracy in Education. I'm not certain, I don't think that's been translated into Espanol yet. Um, uh, but I did send um, a copy of the book to the publisher who did uh, in Santiago, the, who did the, um, uh, the translation of um, Can Education Change Society? So I'm, I'm So the, and this book is my, it's a storytelling book in some ways, you know, this, about what can, you know, the subtitle is Struggle for Democracy in Education, Lessons from Social Reality. So it's a range of stories of successes and contradictory successes, okay? Um, but the story I want to tell is uh, one that I tell a little bit about in Can Education Change Society? And that's the story of the Algebra Project in Baltimore, the third poorest city in the United States. So let me tell the story of that. Um, and I was not involved in this one. These are my teachers about what is possible. I mean, they have given me permission to use this example as a way of answering how curriculum and cultural struggles make a major difference. So let me set the stage here. Baltimore is a largely black and brown city. So it's uh, filled with minoritized people, very poor. Um, and it also was one of the seaports on the East Coast where slaves were brought in. So it has a long history of fighting against racism. Um, and there were a group of critical mathematics educators were deeply interested in using mathematics, which is seen by many poor people as the tool of dominance. So if you look at who does the worst in mathematics in almost any nation, it is minoritized people and working class and poor people. And this is in a time when there was a movement in the United States to make mathematics even more rigorous and harder to build our standards again, to help fight the, uh, our war economically with China. And so this is, you know, we have to understand that the, this is pressures on the schools to have more testing more often, to control teachers, to have a mandatory curriculum um, with teachers having little voice in it and students and communities having zero voice. Now, um, the mandatory curriculum for young teenagers, 12 to 15 year olds, was beginning algebra and beginning statistics. And these are students um, who have failed mathematics all along but it's mandatory. They cannot graduate secondary school unless they pass this year long course. Now the algebra project is very Gramscian. It's one of the reasons I like it. And it's something that uh, is partly a criticism that I have of some of the overly reductive theorians who will want to say that any dominant, any knowledge that's dominant should not be taught. My position is exactly the opposite. We must reconstruct dominant knowledge, but at the same time, we must teach, we must, uh, teach it in a way that solves 
pressing powerful social problems in communities. And mathematics is crucial. So the algebra project, you know, and Gramsci said, if we don't teach dominant knowledge, we are guaranteed to fail. Unless we get rid of the testing and evaluation of teachers and students, you're not doing anyone any favors if you're not teaching them things that they need, because dominant groups will use that as a hammer. So they took dominant knowledge, statistics as an example, and they used the Freyerian and Apple pedagogy in my book, uh, Democratic Schools and Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So those are the two volumes in many ways that they're using. And they had the students form a group and say, we're gonna to have to teach you math, but we want it connected. So we're not gonna start until you tell us what are the problems you're facing every day? So there were three or four days of just students talking to each other and talking to the teachers about what are they facing? And one of the major issues they're facing is the fact that the government, the state and the city are building a new juvenile jail. And right now in Baltimore, one out of every four African-American young men is in prison. And the students are saying, we can't walk down the street without being stopped and searched by the police. And about once a week, every one of us, even if we're doing well in school, is being stopped. And if they find a little bit of marijuana on us, we are accused of drug dealing and we are sent to prison. So we want to, we want to, to change this. And the question is, well, what do you want to happen? And the students talk and talk and they said, why are they building a new juvenile prison? We know that we're gonna be there. So a new pedagogy using the statistics that the students will be tested on later evolves. And the students begin using mean, standard deviation, all the things that are in the introductory statistics course we all had to take to find out whether the juvenile crime rate has gone up or down. And it's gone down by 43%. And they look at where is the money going as the school budget is less and less in real dollars. It's going for prison construction. And they begin to, they have a huge now computers program, you now just stuff, evidence. And they spend about three or four months gaining evidence and learning statistics on how to do it. And they make an alliance with the Occupy movement, so it is now publicized, and with critical journalists on Twitter, on Facebook, on TV and radio. And they use the sort of racist understanding that the mainstream media has, which is students don't care about schools, they're not very articulate, they're not very smart, and they go in, in person to these journalists and present the case. And the journalists go, oh my God, these kids are really smart. And the kids are interviewed, they go to the legislature and all you see are these TV broadcasts now about these kids linking it to whether we should build a new prison. I could go on and on about this, but at the end of this, the prison is not built. Now, the next generation, that is, this took three or four years. Now the question is, where does the money go? Does it go into adult prisons? Does it go into tax breaks for the rich? So the next stage is now ongoing. This is what I call a non-reformist reform which is crucial in my mind. It's Andre Gortz's term. And it says this, there's a million things we could tell stories about and a million things that need to get done. 
anyone who has been an educator at university or schools or community literacy person knows there's a million things that have to get done. Do the things that open the next door. It has to solve the problem you're facing, but it has to open the door to the next problem. That's what the right does all the time. So the next task is to use these skills now to find out where's the money going that's been saved. $70 million for a prison. Is it going to into the pockets as a tax break of the private corporations? Is it going to the wealthy now? So then that's what I call then the non-reformist reform. How we see the next problem. So this is one of my favorite stories because it is about schools and curriculum and good teaching and students not being seen as stupid. So it's part of the epistemological war again. Who is seen as a knower? Where does knowledge come from? And it also is a test of Gramsci, an empirical test. And it also is a test of political economy. So the various factions of the left, race, class, political economy, cultural struggles, changes in the state, coalesce, all come together. My favorite story of how you build these decentered unities and still be in education, okay? Okay, thank you. There, there was a great history, and uh, we have the, the that this, this conversation between us. It was very important for me, and and I learned a lot uh, with you today. So uh, I really think uh, thank. I really like to say thank you uh, for that conversation, and if you want, I will. Uh, I could to send you the video about our interview when I finish uh, the, 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 uh, the producing of the, of the video. What will happen to the video? I will. So, I would like to see the video, but so what's the next step in your work on this? That is what, what happens to this? Yes, I'm right now working in your profile for my book. Uh, and that this interview will be more big important for my for my profile and the last part of the our conversation i will uh, uh, viralize uh, i expect to uh, uh, share with a lot of people and in with my uh, project about the educational transformations and I, 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 will, I will share your uh, words with a, a lot of people and, and, and most people that I uh, uh, connect with. Fine, that's good. All right. Well, again, your questions were outstanding, so thank you. Thank and you. Uh, if I can help in other ways, just contact me again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And it, I, it was very nice to me to uh, know you and uh, prof, uh, profound my knowledge about you. Good. Bye. All Thank right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. <laughs>